This is episode 11 of a series where we examine the cut content, design, and development of Fault 3. Fault 3 uses Havoc physics, and at one point in development they considered using the engine to its full potential. An example of this was the static merry-go-rounds and seesaws found in playgrounds throughout the wasteland actually once worked. These objects that react to the player's actions are still present in the GEC, but neither was ever used. A cloth drape uses the same naming convention and likely would have blown around in the wind, but sadly the texture is missing. Since the release of Doom in 1993, explosive barrels have been a mainstay of the first-person shooter genre, and Bethesda considered them as well. These unused exploding barrels would fly through the air once they took enough damage. These were really cool ideas that would have vastly improved any area where these physics were present, but they were sadly cut, likely due to the resources it would have required. Crippled limbs are healed via the Pip-Boy menu, but originally there was an entire surgery minigame that would have been affected by the player's medicine skill. There are still leftover unused textures, sounds, and game settings intended for this. When the player entered or left the surgery menu, unique sounds played, but both of these were sadly deleted. During the minigame, the player apparently cauterized their wounds and screamed out in pain. It's unknown exactly how it would have functioned, but it seems the player character would have been rendered on screen, as there's three meshes for the male player character, heavy pain, mild pain, and no pain, depending on how well the player did. If you did well and caused yourself no pain, I suspect you'd be healed for the full effect of a stim pack. If you dealt some pain to yourself, you'd be healed less, and perhaps with the heavy pain expression, you'd gain very little HP or even cause damage to yourself. The UI for the minigame can still be accessed, and it suggests the player could have automatically attempted to heal themselves. Their chance of being successful was linked to their medicine skill, akin to how the lockpicking minigame works. It seems that healing wounds would trigger varying sounds depending on what kind of damage you had taken, as one of the missing sound files mentions a burn, while another mentions a wound. There's also decals for good surgery and bad surgery, suggesting that different graphics would have been used depending on the success of the minigame. The bad surgery decal would have displayed blood, while good surgery would have called for the metal impact decal, perhaps representing the player removing bullets from their armor. One of the cut textures displays a surgeon bag that presumably would have been used during the minigame. There's still an unused glow icon for it that would have been used when hotkeying the item, and perhaps it would have restored the health of crippled limbs. There's also two sounds for using medics during the minigame, still called Morphine back from before its name was altered to avoid the game being banned in Australia. Further, there's an unused Pip-Boy icon for Super Stim Packs, an item that had appeared in all games prior to Fallout 3, and it might have been usable during the minigame as well. The icon would later be recycled in New Vegas. The developers realized this minigame slowed the pace down too much and removed it. This was definitely a cool idea, but it's probably for the best that it remains unused. In the classic games, actions like moving or using specific weapons while in combat cost action points, which only regenerated after the start of your next turn. Tactics featured a real-time combat mode option, where all characters took their turns simultaneously and AP regenerated over time. Intriguingly, it seems that Bethesda considered something similar. There are still unused game settings that reveal that action points were once reduced any time the player did just about anything. This ranged from running, jumping, reloading, crouching, standing up, equipping or switching weapons, attacking, healing yourself, throwing weapons, dropping items from your inventory, etc. 
and presumably this would have functioned similarly to stamina in Oblivion. Just about the only action that didn't cost AP was walking. On one hand, this would have been a great homage to the classic games, but for the sake of not making the agility stat totally overpowered, it was probably for the best it was cut. In the final game, AP is only used during fats, which is still a nice tip of the hat to the turn-based systems of old. VATS, or Vault Tech Assisted Targeting System, also went through some notable changes in development. As a section of the Collector's Edition guide mentions, the original inspiration, oddly enough, was the game Burnout, where it often showed very cinematic playbacks of your car crashing in fantastic ways. We said, let's do that, but with body parts. We weren't sure if it was going to be like a Max Payne style bullet time or a Knights of the Old Republic style list of moves, but we knew how the result should look. So we started backward, with how the end result would look, and then backed into the interface and the pure gameplay of it. Vats went through a number of changes, and we toyed around with a lot of things. There were times when we weren't sure of its identity, if it should be more powerful than real-time combat. Initially, all actions in real-time also drained AP from running to shooting. This led to nobody ever shooting in real-time, as it simply further delayed you to use VATS, so we took it out. At one point, you could also target exploitable objects in VATS, like mines and vehicles, but it made the interface really clumsy as you cycled through all these fake targets to select the actual enemies. I also had many people argue with me about letting the player move around in vats, like spending AP to duck and such, but I kept wanting vats to be something that the player could get in and out of quickly, and felt that would bog it down. We also toyed with the numbers a lot, from what it means to hit to how fast cameras move, as these actually affect how powerful the system is, since the player is often animating faster than the world in the playback. We eventually settled on what happens when limbs got crippled, as well as upping the chance for critical strikes and vats just enough to make it feel more powerful. The last thing was VATS Melee, which went through several iterations, from targeting body parts to missing, to chances for power attacks and more. Nothing seemed to work for us, and it finally came down to trying, always hit full body attacks, or taking it out altogether, because all previous systems were no fun. When we finally played it with full body hits, we really loved it, and to think it almost got cut from the game. There's so much to take away from this quote. Being able to target explosive cars, mines, and the cut barrels we talked about earlier would have been a great cinematic inclusion, even if it slowed combat down a bit. Having the option to spend AP to move or duck could have led to some great tactical decisions. While the ability to target individual body parts while using close-range weapons and vats and the addition of power attacks would have been really cool for melee builds. This is yet another example of how Fault 3 is a love letter to the classic games, and while it's too bad so much was cut out, at least the entire system wasn't scrapped. One of the most drastic improvements that New Vegas made over its predecessor was the addition of Iron Sights. However, the ability to aim down sights was considered early in Fault 3's development. The aiming animations all use the IS suffix, which is seemingly shorthand for iron sights. Many of the weapons depict evidence of thought being put into the sights actually working as well. At some point, they decided to cut this for an unknown reason, leaving us with the janky first-person zoom-in animations that are used in the final game. There's an unused hotkey icon for handwear. It seems the gloves were once a separate equipment icon, similar to the way they appear in Oblivion. This could have led to some great character outfits, but in the final game, handwear can't be equipped independently and is always a part of other armor sets. 
The 10mm pistol is one of the most iconic weapons in the series, and was even in the player's inventory at the start of the first game. The company Liquid Development was contracted during F3's production to create art assets, and in this image you can see an early design of the 10mm. Concept art isn't cut content, but it's still really cool to see how much different it looked early in production. Bethesda's first entry features evil, neutral, and good karma. However, Todd Howard revealed that neutral karma was only added into the game very late in development. We're still working on that because honestly, the, the neutral scale, it's more of a recent development for us after playing the game a bunch. Like, we need to do this. So we kind of, you know, we have our laundry list right now, and you know, obviously a much bigger list for good and evil right now, but it's something that we're going to keep building on. I suspect that before this edition, the player started the game with good karma, though it might have only been assigned after the Vault 101 sequence, depending on their choices there. In the final game, Neutral Karma allows the player to recruit certain companions like Sergeant RL3 and Butch, lets you take the impartial meditation perk, and you aren't attacked by hit squads from the Regulators or Talon Company. One of the promotional materials released alongside the game was a vinyl of Einon Zor's official soundtrack. Surprisingly, the soundtrack actually features some cut content, likely due to an oversight while pressing the vinyl. One of the tracks is named Fortress, a song used in-game. However, the song that plays where Fortress should play isn't used at any point and isn't even present in the game files. The metadata for the MP3 suggests this is an earlier, unused version of Fortress. This song is currently playing in the background, but if you'd like to hear its full glory, there's a link below in the description. I mentioned this in a video on New Vegas cut content, but in Fault 3's game files, there's a few unused stealth meters. It appears these would have been used to gradually depict how hidden the player was while using stealth, utilizing a circle that either grew or shrank in size as they were detected by NPCs. There is also another unused version of the stealth meter, and according to some early previews, it was still being used relatively close to launch. A preview from No Mutants Allowed reads, The sneak bar that shows up here is a single bar for everything, so no splitting up between light and sound like Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. For whatever reason, this was later replaced by the hidden, caution, danger system used in the final game, but this variation was a pretty cool idea. There is also an unused version of the radiation meter that tracks how many rads the player has amassed. This version is missing the notches of the meter used in-game. Parallax mapping is an enhancement of bump slash normal maps and is used to add detail and depth to textured surfaces, achieving a more realistic effect. During an early preview, Pete Hines talked about the game's use of parallax mapping, stating, Hines points out a new addition to their engine called parallax occlusion mapping, a realistic per pixel texture destruction model, which he shows by shooting into the concrete road, creating realistic bullet holes. He also notes it helps the artist create the look of ruined buildings and environment. It's notable they mention it helped creating the buildings and environment, as a parallax shader is present in game, but as far as I'm aware it's only used for bullet hole decals and in a small number of locations. An example of this is the moon landing scene at the Museum of Technology. Another instance are the rubble piles found throughout the Bailey and the Citadel. Despite being highly touted in previews, it was barely utilized in the final game, likely due to the PS3's memory issues. While this is pretty esoteric cut content, it would have drastically improved the look of the game's textures, which would have been a great improvement. 
Another early preview mentions, quote, There's destruction everywhere. Destruction requires a great deal of randomness. Lead producer Gavin Carter relays. So one of the things we're playing with is how we apply decals to the world. And not only when you shoot things, but we can actually apply very large decals to any kind of arbitrary geometry. Decals are used in games to apply a texture over an underlying texture, and can be used for dust, blood splatter, etc. In Fault 3, they're used when the player attacks the environment, and the resulting bullet hole that appears is a decal. They're also baked into some textures. However, there's a decal tab in the GEC that was never completely implemented. It would have allowed the developers to place decals on any surface, and resulted in more varied and unique looking destroyed environments. A single decal using this system was placed in the cell Vault 101B, but no textures there actually use it. Further, in some early previews, journalists describe use of this technology for extensive, small-scale destruction of the environment, but this seems to have been almost entirely abandoned by the time of the game's release. Yet another instance of how the pre-release version of Fallout 3 was a significantly different game than what was eventually shipped. Fallout 4 was the first game in the series to feature fully 3D loading screens, but it seems they originally considered it for Fallout 3, as there are some unused test files in the interface BSA. Technically, the existing loading screens are 3D, but these unused test files are more ambitious and seem to be a precursor to the way they appear in Bethesda's future titles. This isn't all that surprising, as many elements that were cut from Fallout 3 would later appear in the fourth installment. Speaking of loading screens, there's an unused loading screen from early in development, and it reads, In the year 2277, Washington, D.C. has been reduced to a nuclear shattered wasteland, where the noble forces of the Brotherhood of Steel wage constant war against an army of hideous super mutants. I love the look of this loading screen, and I wish it had made it in. Some of these changes would have made Fallout 3 into an even better game. Ultimately though, all of this was left on the cutting room floor.